advocacy and to introduce themselves. Uh, JT, would you like to start? Sure, this is JT Parker. I work at the Indiana Prosecuting Attorneys Council as the Deputy Director for Administrative and Civil Law. Thank you, JT. Justin? Justin Forker, I'm the Chief Administrative Officer for the Indiana Supreme Court. Grant? Sure, I'm Grant Lindman. I'm the uh, Director of Engagement and Analytics in the Management Performance Hub, focusing on public safety. And I'm in the process of transitioning some of these responsibilities to our newest member, Caitlin Christian. Thank you, Grant. Caitlin? Hi, everyone. I'm Caitlin Christian. I am with the Management Performance Hub as well. I am the Director of Engagement and Analytics, and I'll be taking over the public safety portfolio. Thank you, Caitlin. Torin? Yeah, I'm Torin Liddell. Uh, I am the Research and Statistics Analyst for the Indiana Public Defender Commission. Uh, which is a sister organization to the Indiana Public Defender Council that uh, Bernice is the director of. Um, and of course, Bernice is also on the commission itself. Thank you, Torin. Devin? Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Evan Lauder. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Criminology, Law and Society at George Mason University. Happy to be here. Thank you, Dr. Lauder. Uh, Devin McDonald. I'm Devin McDonald. I'm the executive director at the Criminal Justice Institute. Great. Uh, Sarah, followed by Shelby. I'm Sarah Shelley with the Indiana Department of Correction. I am the executive director of data science and analytics. I am Shelby Thomas, representing the executive director for drug prevention, treatment, and enforcement. I am our communications coordinator and handle operations as well. Thank you. Uh, Christine, followed by Dave. I'm Christine Reynolds. I'm the Research Division Director at the Criminal Justice Institute. Dave Williams. I'm a Project Manager with Trial Court Technology. Thanks, Dave. Last but not least, uh, Jay. Jay Chaudhary, uh, Director of the Division of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, everybody, for doing that. And we are assisted by April Dupree, who's just been fantastic. Um, next, I'll share our proposed um, agenda. So this was the proposed agenda that went out uh, to the group. And I'll do this to be quick. Are there, if there are no objections to um, the agenda, can we just show it approved by acclamation? Okay, I'm not hearing any objections, so I'll take it as acclamation. Next, moving on then, and let me, I wanna say something about the, the agenda. I know in our emails, uh, there, was some, there was a request to go over MPH's, um, um, oh, re, I think it was a re-arrest um, table that MPH produces, and there was another table that MPH produces, and there was a request from Steve Luce to go over those, and uh, Steve Luce particularly wanted to focus on like county results. Uh, Steve could not be with us today, and so I thought we could just put that agenda item to another time. So I just wanted to be clear. I, I, we didn't forget it or skip over it. I just wanted everyone who brought it up to be able to be present to hear the input from MPH on it and also to get uh, the proper staff from DCS and Lake County to be on as well. So with that, the next item I'd like to move to are the um, minutes for this group that went out as well. Um, so these went out to everybody, and if you, thank you, uh, April. So I'll stop talking, give you all a second to look at them, and if we can have a motion to approve them. Bernice, I would move to approve. I do, there's a, right there in the middle of your screen right now, under number two, there's a typo in Steve's name, but subject to that being changed, I think I'm okay with the minutes. Thank you very much for catching that. So we'll show the um, a motion to approve the minutes with the amendment of correcting Steve's name. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Everyone in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Okay, so we'll show the minutes approved with the correction of Steve's name. Uh, so going back to the agenda, the next item, 
is uh, I shared with you all the exciting news that court services was making available to this group, the assistance of Dr. Louder. And what the, the next step was to get a proposal or scope of work from Dr. Louder, um, just to engage in discussion around that, to ask any questions that this group wants to ask, to make sure that the scope of work reflects what you all had wanted to see out of this group. So please take this as a time to, I mean, Dr. Louder is here also to answer questions. So um, we'll have Dr. Louder go over her scope of work and proposal and uh, points of view, but then please take the opportunity to ask questions and um, make suggestions, et cetera. So with that, we'll move on to Dr. Louder. Thanks, Bernice. And am I able to screen share here? Looks like yes. Yes, you can. Okay, I think that'll be easiest. I can kind of walk through things. Um, well, like Bernie said, so I put together uh, this scope of work. I'm very open to you know any sorts of you know feedback that you all might have. I have a Word document open, so I will be furiously taking notes as uh, I get questions. Um, but really, the the purpose of this proposal, based on kind of what I understand as you know the overarching goals of this group. Um, is to advance understanding of disparities in what I call criminal legal processing in the state of Indiana, which um, is just kind of a you know, new term that has been adopted more probably in the research literature to kind of you know, cover the broad array of criminal justice system contact that people have um, you know, during, during their time in that system. So uh, the goals for the scope of work that I put together are four fourfold. First, to document the local and statewide uh, data sources to actually measure criminal legal decision making. So what is actually available um, and what, what are kind of the data points within those data sources. Second, to identify the key measures for assessing rate, racial equity and criminal legal decision making um, that actually reflects available data and um, empirical trends. Three, to understand criminal legal decision points that might contribute um, or that we have evidence that are contributing to racially disparate outcomes. And fourth, um, I think, you know, kind of looking forward to actually further data collection efforts at the local and state level that can facilitate um, improved tracking of these criminal legal decisions, particularly those that we know uh, you know, appear to be uh, key decision points that might be contributing to racially disparate outcomes. So those are kind of the goals. Um, and essentially what I have done is propose kind of a two-part investigation. I'm just gonna go here to the second page. You can kind of see the broad objectives and deliverables for these two components. So the first is what I call kind of just mapping the data systems and developing equity measures. Um, and so, we had kind of talked in a smaller group about, uh, you know, what would be kind of a reasonable uh, scope for this investigation. And I think it's important to recognize that a lot of these data sources are actually collected at the lo local level. Um, you know, I'm very familiar with those data sources through my work in pretrial. Uh, and so kind of, so we want, we want to kind of have participation of local jurisdictions to be able to, you know, capture some of those data sources. But then also recognizing that, you know, there are efforts, um, you know, kind of past, present and future that are going that are trying to, you know, aggregate a lot of these data sources to the statewide level. And so recognizing that there's going to be data sources at that level, too. So the kind of purpose of this, right, is to, you know, get a handle on those data sources at both of those levels using a kind of subsample of three to four local jurisdictions um, that are willing to kind of engage in this work to you know, document what's available in those data sources across those jurisdictions at the local and state le statewide level to identify the data decision points um, within those data sources that could begin to establish racial equity measures. And then actually kind of assessing you know, feasibility of doing some retrospective data language to basically track individuals across um, you know, criminal legal system processing uh, and then, you know, actually doing that linkage. So the idea is that, you know, this first um, kind of component of the work would actually provide, you know, first some sort of compendium of data sources and data points that are available both locally and at the state level uh, to create a uniform list of decision points that we find kind of in common uh, across these uh, data sources and agencies. 
that can inform actual racial equity measures, um, a preliminary list of key racial equity measures and criminal legal processing. Uh, most importantly, I think recommendations for kind of improved tracking um, to be able to kind of measure these things going forward. Um, and then I think as well, uh, some kind of lessons learned about, you know, barriers and considerations for collecting and reporting on these measures. So I'm happy to answer questions about this kind of component first, if, if there are any. If there aren't, I can go ahead and, you know, talk about kind of how I see the second component complementing um, this first part. Dr. Louder, I have a quick question. Yes. And JTN, I'll need you to refresh my memory. Do you have a sense of what three or four, um, and when you say jurisdic three or four ju local jurisdictions, when you say jurisdiction, do you mean county? I'm talking about you? counties, yeah. Okay. And then do you have, I know you've done a lot of work with several Indiana counties. So um, do you have an idea of ones that you think would make sense or how would those be identified? So I think, you know, willingness to engage in this process is super, super important, right? We want um, kind of local partners who are, you know, going to work with us and be willing to share data and kind of engage in the, you know, hard work that um, is necessary. I do have kind of one county that, you know, I've been talking with kind of behind the scenes that I think um, could potentially be interested, but um, I mean, I would think we kind of, you know, put out a call like, hey, there are dollars to support this work to, you know, engage in this process. I think there's a lot of local jurisdictions that are interested in, you know, doing this type of work. So to have, you know, this funded by, um, you know, very generously by IOCS, I think would be hopefully an attractive thing. Um, and then kind of once we figure out who's interested, it, interested, um, we maybe narrow that list down based on kind of these criteria. So I don't, you know, want to get just all jurisdictions that look the same. Um, but I also don't want to pinpoint jurisdictions and, you know, get folks on board who or on, on our list that aren't on board, right? Because um, that makes my job a lot more difficult, of course. <laughs> yeah, okay. I have a question real quick. Yeah. So through through kind of, I guess, steps one through five, I guess, and, and part one, um, Doctor, do you do you intend to utilize any of the work we've already done through JRAC or EBDM or things like that? Because so I know a lot of work's been done on some of these points already. So is it to kind of build upon that or are you actually looking to to Oh, I mean, absolutely. I am happy to build on, use whatever work um, has been done previously. So I would look forward to having kind of those conversations. Absolutely. Um, I see this as more as, um, uh, you know, part of the conversation that, you know, is happening in academic circles, um, which is referenced in uh, one of the sources that I cited. Um, I can scroll down here. It's this uh, Curly Check and Johnson um, 2019 paper, which is in the annual review of criminology. And if um, I'm happy to send that paper to um, anyone privately who would like to read it. Um, but essentially like what they talk about an annual review of criminology is kind of a state of the science type um, uh, journal outlet. And what they talk about is kind of the lack of system-wide research, right? That we're not tracking kind of cumulative uh, decisions and cumulative effects of decisions, right, across the entirety of criminal justice processing. And so that, that essentially is what this proposal is attempting to um, address, right? Like, how do you understand, you know, cumulative disadvantage? How do you understand disparate um, impact, disparate treatment, right? If you can't understand the decisions that come before any given decision in criminal legal processing. And so that's kind of what I see this contribution being. Um, and I mean, certainly there's going to be pieces of this, you know, at various stages, various data sources where there might have been already a ton of uh, work that you all have done um, in Indiana to you know, develop measures that are useful to identify data sources. And I will definitely be, you know, relying on that in, um, you know, some of this work. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. Any other questions about this first part? Otherwise, I'm happy to go on to talk about the second part. 
Okay. Well, what I see kind of this second um, part is kind of, uh, you know, really increasing the rigor of the investigation. So, you know, one challenge with kind of relying on retrospective data is that we have very limited uh, information on the individuals themselves who are coming into the system and, you know, the pre previous experiences, the life experiences that they bring with them that, you know, may or may not affect um, their experience throughout criminal legal processing. And so some of the things that I've been talking um, with other local jurisdictions about is whether you could actually, um, you know, provide some sort of, you know, more uh, thorough, you know, screening at the time of jail intake, um, which to me seems to be kind of the most feasible place to have this, right? Um, where you could get at some of these factors that we know are you know, factors that affect disproportionately um, racial minorities' involvement in the criminal legal system. So I put you know, some examples here of kind of some of these constructs, right? Socioeconomic status, um, uh, neighborhood, prior justice system contact, intergenerational impacts of criminal justice involvement, uh, health and well being, et cetera, right? Um, and by kind of getting a measure of these factors on a cohort, which is basically just a group of people who are entering uh, the jail in these respective counties, um, you know, over a given period, and then tracking their outcomes, we can kind of understand the role of these factors in, you know, the subsequent processing. So it kind of increases our understanding um, of kind of the role of systemic disparities in contributing to disparate outcomes, and then kind of above and beyond that, how disparate decision making might truly, you know, be, uh, you know, be resulting in uh, disparate outcomes, right? Above and beyond all these factors we know that people bring into the system. Um, so this is why kind of some of the deliverables that are focusing on here are really, you know. Um, you know, focused on kind of the quality of that evidence, right? And so I put here updated guidance on the high priority racial equity measures that contribute most to racially disparate outcomes, thinking that, you know, we're going to have better evidence on truly what are the decision makes that appear to be, you know, even accounting for all the stuff that people bring uh, with them into the system that are really putting people on, you know, even more disparate paths. And so I see that as, um, you know, very, very critical to even thinking about how the system, the criminal legal system itself can intervene to help people um, or to, you know, reduce kind of the impact of some of those outcomes. Um, and then also kind of informing, you know, if, if the criminal legal system is even an appropriate point of intervention, right? Or whether, you know, some of that, uh, you know, some of the disparity is just happening, you know, in the community and whether it's just a broader, you know, more community resources to, you know, kind of reduce the effects of some of these other factors. So again, I think it's, you know, we have some evidence, but I think it's an empirical question on uh, the one that just hasn't been resolved um, in, in the science currently on, you know, how those things unfold. Dr. Lauder, can I interrupt you? Yes, please. So uh, the, the part two objective one that you're mentioning so as I'm reading, uh, as I read that, I totally agree, of, of course, I would love to, you know, have our system see all those things. But as you're talking, I was thinking, we have so many moving trains in our criminal justice system, right? So, and I'm about to try to talk about something I don't know a lot about. So Devin or anybody, I invite you to <laughs> comment or correct. But, you know, you know that Indiana is working on uh, building a jail intake system to collect data but it's certainly not tooled to collect the, you know, all these data points. So on the one hand, we have a very good moving train that is gonna make things better than it is uh, in terms of jail data, but it's certainly not gonna go as far as part two, objective one. So I guess, how do we make this match up? How do we make these two train cars connect to one another? Um, will it just take willingness on the part of a jail in, in a county that we're working with to say, yeah, we'll use an additional tool to track these things or how would that look? My assumption was that for the purpose of this investigation, it would be an additional tool that they would need to um, kind of collect that information. And then we would have resources either locally or, you know, a research assistant um, who works with me, for example, who could help kind of enter that data. So, um, 
you know, prospective data collection is super messy, right? It's super time intensive. Um, that's why, you know, a lot of researchers, myself included, we rely on, you know, retrospective data, um, data collected previously in administrative records, right? Um, but the problem is, you know, the quality of that data, um, as you all know, right, is, is a lot lower. We can't control what's being collected. Um, our ability to kind of measure things, control for things that we know to be, um, you know, correlates of justice system involvement is, is quite limited. So um, I see this as, you know, this is going to improve our actual um, knowledge and kind of some of the causal relationships between decision making that happens in the criminal legal system and disparate outcomes, right? It's not as much probably, at least, um, you know, in, in the scope of work that I propose going to, you know, change the way long term that uh, data are collected. I don't see that being possible, um, at least with with the resources that we're talking about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But I, I think uh, certainly through the, the, the pilot, you know, Bernice, maybe somewhat to your point, and Dr. Louder, if we, if the pilot is tracking things that we do think are useful, wherever that gets entered, if it's the jail management system, if it's Odyssey, or it's the prosecutor system or something, you know, if it works, then, you know, I, I think we have some flexibility on those systems, hopefully going forward to build that into the process somewhere once we know we, we're asking the right questions in the right way at the right points. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, I think there are some kind of, uh, you know, legal questions there too, on like, you know, what information do you want to have available to decision makers? And I'm not a lawyer by training, right? I'm a applied psychologist and criminologist, so I can't, you know, answer that question really, but that might be something to think about as well. So I can say from a research standpoint, right, these would be great things to have, but you know, do you want, um, you know, to what extent do you want decisions accounting for these things, right? So Dr. Ladder, I'm just looking at like socioeconomics as an example. And when I was a PD in initial court, there are two factors that really mattered to judges as they helped, as they formulated release decisions. Did my person have a job? Do they have kids, right? Mm -hmm. So when I would talk to the person ahead of time, those are two things that we really wanted to stress to the court that if you let this person stay out pre-trial, the benefit is they're going to be more stable because they're going to keep their job or they're going to, you know, still be able to keep their kids because if they're arrested, right, there's this whole ripple effect of them losing their job, further destabilizing, losing their kids. Like, I, so I would even add like child custody <laughs> as a, as a factor. And, okay. I think, and I think that's important because the system should know I think the full cost of incarcerating someone. Um, so if the cost is when they get out, now they're on some social benefit that maybe otherwise they would not have been on had they kept their construction job or, you know, just named some, you know, position, then we have to evaluate, was it worth arresting them or detaining them for their, you know, level six felony or their amist, you know, whatever. Um, so that's how I think of these factors and think it will be important to have so we know if someone is in a pretrial incarcerated and they had those factors in place, well, now we as a society have to decide what was the full cost there of incarcerating that person. And I think that's important for us to be looking at. Yes, I think that's super important. Um, I also, I mean, I think it raises some complication too in trying to understand disparate decision-making, right? Because if you know that these are factors that, you know, uh, you know, people of color may be less likely to have stable employment, right? Um, black men in particular might be less like likely to have custody of their children, right? That those factors could actually, um, you know, be contribute to or explain some of the disparate decision making at that point, right? Um, so it's not that, you know, necessarily judges or prosecutors are, you know, intentionally trying to uh, you know, make disparate decisions, right? But that these factors are what are explaining that. And so it, it suggests, you know, one, we either think about, um, you know, what factors are going into that decision, right? Or two, you know, more resources in the community to actually, you know, help with family reunification, give people employment, things like that. Well, now that you said that, that my idea of child custody could 
impact a sex disparity too, right? Because mm -hmm. generally speaking, if families aren't intact, then um, very few men are going to be in a position of having custody of their so. Yeah. So it's very yeah. complicated, but that's why we measure these things, right? So we can understand we can understand the relationship better. Otherwise, you know, I I come back in you know part one and I tell you, oh, like there's a disparity here, right? We need to address this, but it's like, well, how do you even know how to start answering that question? I wouldn't be able to tell you, um, you know, why or how, how to approach it. Okay, so I mean, the last page was just kind of a, um, what I saw as like a proposed timeline. Obviously, I think a, a bulk of the work, right, could happen kind of within an initial 18 month period, kind of focusing the first part on kind of this data procurement um, and then also the retrospective data linkage. Um, the only thing that's extending this timeline, obviously, is tracking the criminal legal um, outcomes for individuals. So if we're talking about prospective data collection, right, we just need time for those cases to kind of reach disposition. Um, it would be great if we could look at kind of sentencing outcomes and, um, you know, post release community supervision too. Um, that would be probably a longer term project than kind of what we're uh, proposing here. But I mean, I think there's definitely opportunity to kind of continue to understand, you know, the cycle um, that potentially keeps people um, in the system. So I'm happy to answer any other questions that folks might have. Um, I have a question so moving from the strategic to the tactical. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at this data, are you uh, wanting MPH to be the area where the data is linked, where it's held, or were you wanting to actually take possession of the data? We would probably be doing the linkage um, here. At least that was my initial thought. Um, given kind of the disparate nature of local data sources, um, I mean, I've seen some some interesting files um, from local local jurisdictions, right? And every every data source is different. So, um, you know, I think we would have, you know, a bit more ability to kind of do, um, you know, a bit more manual dive into uh, you know, some of the data sources, at least at the local level. Um, in terms of linking kind of that stuff up with you know, statewide systems, I think you know, that, that could be an open question how we wanna approach that. Um, but at least like the local data, I would think probably doing it um, you know, here outside of MPH. Okay, I didn't know if you were aware of the tools that MPH has to do those. Oh, I, I'm very aware. I've used a okay. lot of MPH data. <laughs> Just making sure that um, because if we use the enhanced research environment, the ERE, it's a controlled environment. And sometimes due to security concerns and other things, um, that could be helpful to researchers so that state agencies don't necessarily have to release large data sets, but we can link it here and then in a controlled environment so the mm -hmm. analysis can be done. So I just wanted to flag that point and since you're aware of it, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's very helpful. Um, so, I mean, I think that's an open question, right? Um, that we would have to think about uh, for sure. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Dr. Lauder, I see your proposed timeline, but what are you sort of envisioning is your, your actual, you know, assigning dates to those years and months? Is there something you're, you're waiting on or do you have a, a when you think you'd be able to launch date or get started on that year one, month one? Um, nothing huge that I'm waiting on. Um, I have some just uh, specific contractual things um, with the university about kind of when I can get paid and, you know, whatever that is, you know, <laughs> beyond the need to discuss here. But um, uh, yes, yeah, so I mean, I think Part of this is, um, you know, IOCS is putting together a contract. So, you know, figuring out what that's going to look like, what, you know, what work, you know, the first round of funding can actually um, fund based on kind of what we're anticipating, um, you know, the person power to put to this. So, uh, I mean, I would hope, you know, by the fall, end of the year at, at the very latest, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Okay. So Dr. Lauder, I'm looking at 
Oh, Bernice, I think you went, you muted yourself. Thank you. Uh, so I'm looking at, you know, the re recruiting jurisdictions, implementing a tool that will be used in jails to collect the data. Well, you muted yourself again. Very weird. <laughs> I'm actually not doing that. I okay. keep thinking this weird symbol, a little microphone that says automatically muting. So uh, I'll keep an eye on that. Thank you. Um, so should this group, while we're thinking about what jurisdictions, or I hear what you said about a call out uh, to, to counties to see who's willing, it would seem to me, and this is JT, if you could refresh my memory, like JT, we were talking about a couple, just casually talking about a couple of counties. And, um, you know, on, on the knee jerk, you might go, well, those counties are kind of not representative of Indiana because they're not diverse enough. And JT got some population data and was actually to show like one particular county we were talking about was like a mini Indiana um, in terms of its ratio of race and breakdown. So that being said, when we, should we do a call out only to counties that are like a little Indiana in their population? Or, or are you looking for some that aren't so diverse or what do you think? Honestly, I mean, I, I'm pretty open. Um, you know, I think regardless of kind of which jurisdictions are included, like I see that as a starting point, right? Like, um, you know, how do we understand local data sources the way that they're, you know, reflected and interfacing with kind of these statewide data sources? What are the commonalities across these systems? And what can, you know, those data sources actually tell us about disparate trends, right? Um, so I don't think we necessarily need to focus so much on, you know, ensuring population generalizability to the state of Indiana. I don't think that's a realistic endeavor. Um, so, you know, I'm pretty open. I do think that, you know, from my experience, like, you know, smaller jurisdictions, um, mid-sized jurisdictions that have a uh, kind of smaller, uh, you know, racial minority population, right? Um, that doesn't necessarily mean much for the criminal justice system, right? We still might see kind of overrepresentation of people of color in um, the criminal justice system, and that in and of itself could, you know, be helpful in kind of understanding some of these trends. So, um, yeah, I would say really no preference. I think the easiest thing for me is going to be counties that you know have good data infrastructure and are willing to kind of engage in this process. And then additionally any call out would have to have a sheriff, right? That's very willing exactly, to engage. Yep. Okay. Yep, that's true. I have to jump in here. Unfortunately, we have an MPH internal meeting that was scheduled over the top of this because this is the first time that we're all kind of getting back to the office. So this looks like great work. Please keep us all informed and um, thank you all. And we'll be in touch. Thanks, Grant. Bye. Bye, Caitlin. Well, um, Dr. Lauder has presented the scope of work. Is there any, we've asked questions, are, is there anything you'd like to see added, taken away, um, any input on the scope of work? So this is Devin. Um, I know a few of us here on the call as well are kind of working on that data project with the victim notification system. So I know Dr. Lauder, I know you've not been involved with that at all. It's, it's a state, state process. So um, kind of into the discussions and a lot of data points and things that you mentioned in, in number two are also data points that we've discussed within the project. And some of that stuff, some of those data points um, may or may not be collected um, locally uh, through the JMS or may or may not be already or in the process of being developed to be transferred to the state. So um, maybe what I'd like to do moving forward, and I, and I don't, I can't pull the list up right now because my computer will crash, but um, maybe what we can do further is uh, we, we can kind of cross paths with these two projects and see how we can, how one can help facilitate the other. Absolutely, that would be wonderful. Um, yeah, and I'd be very curious to see what what those data points are. Thank you for that, Devin. That's a great point. 
Um, anybody else? I'm excited to, to see it kind of get launched. Mary Kay Hudson just sent me an email telling me that I've already approved it. So <laughs> I thought it sounded familiar. Um, but I, you know, I do think getting some of these questions asked as we look at from our side, you know, ways that we train and, and coach judges on issues of disparate impact and their decision making process, using this as a sort of way to establish some baseline things. So we can tell if we're moving the right needles in the right directions by what we're doing will be very, very helpful. Um, so Justin, is that a motion to <laughs> adopt the scope of work? <laughs> If, if that's what you're asking for, Bernice, I, I'd make that motion. If that's what the outcome is we need from this meeting, sure. Is there a second? This is Devin, I'll second. Thank you, Devin. Uh, all those in favor, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, so this is the scope of work that is agreed upon by this work group, and we'll report it out to the full JRAC. So the JRAC knows that that we are doing this work and, and moving forward. Um, I think in terms of the next to do's for this body, um, I, and Dr. Lauer, tell me your thoughts on this. Um, does it make sense for this committee to start crafting or working on a call out to committees or how would you like to see that roll out? I think that would be great. I mean, that would be super helpful um, on my end. I mean, I put a month for it because I was like, oh, you know, I figured we could kind of start working on it, um, you know, before the formal work started. So um, yeah, that would be terrific. Excellent. Um, so we won't take the time up today because it looks like we are, believe it or not, we're already very close to an hour um, here, but what I'll propose is this, um, two things I'd like to follow up on is, is the public meeting nature of things. Like what I mean to say is if we'll continue streaming this way or do we need to physically meet? Um, I'm curious to know, do you all prefer meeting virtually or do you all prefer to meet in person? What, what's the will of the group? I'd prefer to meet virtually, personally. Me too. <laughs> Any, anybody, uh, see, I, I agree with JT. I think this is so convenient uh, to meet this way. Um, is anybody just hankering to see each other in person? You'll, you'll never hear me saying that, but I, I yeah. would second the, the virtual. I think particularly given the things we're looking at, it's a lot easier to share a screen and track things like that. I love it. So we're all on the same page on that. Excellent. Okay, um, so we'll, I think though, based on the update, so I'll, we'll have more details on if we're gonna continue to stream and meet virtually or if for whatever reason we have to convert to in person. Um, then how about um, a smaller group of us can start working on what we think a call out should look like, um, make sure it covers all the grounds we talk about how does this get messaged out to communities as a call out. Uh, we'll work with court services, court uh, services staff on that too for ideas. And then we can bring it back to this full group to discuss, be sure that it makes sense and that we're all comfortable with it, with it rolling out. Um, sorry, I'm making notes as I'm talking. Um, and then I'm thinking on our next agenda, assuming availability that we can go back and talk about the MPH questions that we had about MPH as dashboards on rearrest, et etc. Um, and that conversation would include some staff from DOC um, that is assigned to Lake County because Lake County was kind of an outlier in some of those results and that was some of the conversation that that was needed to be had or to try to better understand why it was such an outlier. Is there any other agenda items that you all would like to see in the next meeting? All right, if anything comes to mind, uh, just email myself or Steve or April or all of us. Um, before we part, is there anything anybody wants to bring up or discuss?
that wasn't on the agenda? No, I'm seeing everybody is ready to call it a day. This has been a productive meeting. Thank you all for your time and the questions. Dr. Lauder, thank you for the work you put in on the scope of work. And, and we're really excited to be working with you um, and having this structure and guidance as we tackle really complicated, mm -hmm. um, difficult mm -hmm. questions. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you and, for having me. Yes, and Justin, thank you for approving it. Uh, appreciate, <laughs> appreciate very much uh, your help on this. So everyone have a great day. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.